While some people were focused on like trying to get a picture with Ye or impressing Ye, I'm like, if I leave today, I'm leaving here with something. You know, he'll go off on somebody and I'm thinking, okay, they're about to cry. And they're just motivated. Like they're like, yo, okay, cool. Ye believe in me. Like that's what they got from that. Rick Rubin was walking out. He was like, I don't know how you're a professional if you're not even a student. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and culture. Yet again, we are back. This is No Labels Necessary, and we love to bring you guys guests who have something special to offer. And today we have none other than Mike Norris, who's going to be talking about flipping opportunities, right? Because he's had internships. He's worked with Kanye in, in, in a certain level, and he's always been figured out a way to come out with something. And I want to figure how you do that because everybody in music is always looking for an opportunity. How do you get these opportunities? How do you just end up working um, with Kanye or helping Kanye? Or how do you take a moment like that and not end up scoring where some people are like, man, I was around this group, but I came out with nothing. And now I'm working my regular job that I was working before. So like talking with you, I find it, I find it really dope that it seems like you figure out a way to continue to, to navigate and find something that you could like take from every experience that you've had. And first and foremost, thank you for hopping on, bro. Yeah, appreciate um, you, man. But let's start here. How do you get into the music industry specifically? Well, first and foremost, thank y'all for having me. I love what you said about flipping opportunities. I never heard anybody use that term before, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, I got my start in music. So my grandfather was a pastor. Uh, so back when I was in elementary school, we used to go to church. And he, he was a reverend, so it wasn't like a traditional pastor where he has a church and he just stays there. Like He would go to churches that only had three members, five members that were struggling to stay afloat. And he would just go and he would turn them up. He'd take them from three members to 30 to 300. And then once it's healthy, put a pastor in place, go on to the next church and rebuild it. And doing that and seeing his service to others, I wanted to be of service to him. And so, you know, he needed a minister of music at, at, at his churches. And I volunteered. I was like, yo, granddad, I want to help. And I just naturally had a gift for music. Like my grandma took me to the, we went to Walmart and it was an electric keyboard. And I walked up and I just started playing it. I, I just played whatever I was feeling. And a whole crowd of people just gathered around me. It was probably like 20, 30 people at Walmart just breathless and mesmerized as this little kid just goes to work. <laughs> and my grandma, like, she's like, move, move, move. And she's fighting through the crowd because she didn't know what was going on. Like, she was just worried about her grandbaby. And she grabs me and she's like, how'd you do that? I'm like, I don't know. And so after that, my uncle bought a piano and then they got me enrolled. He didn't buy the piano for me. He bought it for her to get her to make <laughs> lessons. But, you know, obviously she didn't take them. So she, you know, that was my piano. They enrolled me lessons like a week after that. And from there, I, I just started on the journey. And I saw Classic 3000 by Andre 3000. Mm. And I was like, I grew up in Southern Illinois. It's like super country town. People would ride horses to Walmart. Like four doors down, my neighbor had a, had a staple of horses. And we go down there and ride them sometimes. So... There wasn't many, there was nobody living full time off music. Like, that wasn't a thing. You sounded crazy to even bring that up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I saw Class of 3000, my Andre 3000. I was like, yo, mom, is, is Atlanta a real place? Is that like really a thing? <laughs> There's performing art school and black people everywhere. She was like, yeah, that's what Atlanta's like. I'm like, I'm going to go to Atlanta. And I made that decision as a kid. And when I became a man, I, I followed through with that commitment. That's what's up. That's yeah. crazy, man. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Did he, did he come from deeper country than you? Or is that the same level of country? No, I sound about the same. <laughs> yeah, my, my neighbors have horses too, bro. Y'all like, all find y'all way to Atlanta. <laughs> right. Atlanta opportunity, bro. Atlanta opportunity. Okay. So, so, I mean, bro, you mentioned, um, you said something like at the time, right, you weren't sure that people could make it in music coming from where you come from. Mm -hmm. So, like, what was the first instance you remember having where you were like, oh, like, working in music is possible? Man, it was... I don't know. It, it's between in college when I was broke, I would street perform. And so the, I would take my horn and I would go to like Piedmont Park. They have this little like tunnel there and it had like great reverb. And I'll just go there and I play my horn. 
and I go there for like 30 minutes to an hour, but I would average $30 every half hour. So if I ever stay for like a full hour, I'm making 50 to $60 just playing my horn. And I would do that like regularly. Like at first it was just when I was broke, but I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm getting my practice time. And I'm basically, I'm a music major, so we're required to play nine hours a week. So I'm like, yo, I'm getting paid to practice. So mm-hmm. uh, I started doing that. And then I started getting gigs for like 250 here, 300 here, 500 here. And it's just for like a three hour show playing my horn. So I'm like, oh, I, I could really, like, this is like something that, that's fruitful. That's, that's on the performance side. Eventually I switched over to music management. And, you know, seeing I can make a living off of that, that was Rico Brooks. And it, it is funny because I was talking to Flex Bowman. Um, he's over Reach Record. He manages Lecrae. And me and him just went golfing this past weekend. And he had the same story. He was saying, like, Rico just took him out for a week, had him with him every day, just running different errands, going on different missions, pulling up to the studio. And he just, you know, got to see Metro and Sonny. I got the same experience. Like, I'm going to the studio with Rico and Sonny has an event going on or he's about to work with Chance the Rapper or... Uh, like just seeing Rico's house, like he had two, he has two houses in Atlanta. So we, he has his regular house, and then he had the studio house. So he's building a studio, and he's like, "Oh, we're going to the studio house today." And I go to the studio. The regular house has like ten plaques. Studio house has like fifty plaques. And so I'm like, "Okay, this is like this is a real manager who's not at any label. Like he's doing this independently, and he lives a lavish lifestyle. Can go where he wants, dress how he wants, pay people, hire staff." And so I'm like, "Okay, nah, like." We can, and I was interning for him. That was probably like my my junior year, junior year of college. Mm. So, where did you take that internship into? Uh, Rico. So now we we I want to call it a partnership, but we've done. We we he's broken red up red with me uh more than more than a couple of times. So now I have a producer who, you know, he has, let's say he's generated a twenty five thousand fifty thousand dollars. And publishing, he wants a deal. I don't have that twenty five to fifty to give him, but I can go to Rico and be like, "Yo, Rico, I need this," and he'll 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 sign them, and we can either bust down the profit or he'll just give me a finder's fee, and I I can get that off top. And that's just a relationship that's oh. And then like my clients, they've collaborated with his clients, so you know I have clients that are sending beats to Sunny, June the Genius, uh, Beat God XL, like, and then he consults for different record labels. So I've had clients hop on projects with those artists that he consults for. So. It's just a, a very collaborative relationship that we have. Dope, dope. And when you say clients, you're talking about producers, right? Yes, sir. All right, so we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, if you're listening to this and you're looking to grow your music career, boost your streams and your fan base, me, J.R. McKee, and Jacory are looking for 60 artists to meet with us in person so we can help them in this limited environment, this one-time opportunity personally to build your music career. So on August 12th in Atlanta, like Sean said, it's gonna be a super exclusive event. We're gonna be giving out information that we haven't really been able to share anywhere else. And we wanna make sure that you're one of those people that gets to walk away with this game. So if you wanna get your tickets, go to nolabelsnecessary.com or check the link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Like I said, we're not doing 61, we're not doing 62, just a hard 60, and we wanna make sure that those 60 people are the best quality people that will actually Facts. use this game. So the hopefully we- The is literally at capacity at that number. <laughs> like no more than that. So <laughs> be one of those 60 if you're serious, come dap us up, make sure that we real, and yeah, we'll see you there. Nolabelsnecessary.com. I want you to touch on how you got the opportunity to be a production assistant for Kanye during the period where he was in Mercedes-Benz Stadium, staying overnight, you know, all kind of media Mm -hmm. rumors going on, making it seem like it was this crazy thing. He like, he just took over the stadium. Push-ups. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The push-ups, I didn't hear no push-ups. You didn't see the live stream where he was on push-ups? I did. He was 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 getting it in. I I would love to hear about, first of all, how you got that opportunity. Um, And then, of course, we can get into some of the details of it. Yeah, so I have a friend named Kyle, and uh, he was kind of hired to manage that situation by Cortez. So his mentor is Cortez Bryant, and Cortez manages, like, you know, Lil Wayne, uh, Drake, well, formerly Lil Wayne and Drake. So you'll hear Wayne, uh, you'll hear Drake shout him out a lot, like, oh, Tez and Wayne are responsible for this. Like, they're talking about Cortez Bryant. He's actually a member of my fraternity, KK Psy, but I'm cool with, like, his whole young generation, like, all the young execs that he's grooming up. Like, those are the people who I kind of run with and we do events together. So, you know, they gave Kyle the opportunity and Kyle was one of the first people he called. He was like, yo, Tez wants me to put together some teams to just, you know, be the production assistants for the whole Donda 
the uh, whole Donda, I want to call it a camp, but the whole Donda camp album. So Kyle, it was one morning I wake up and this is actually after he had already done the first show. Like, like he, he hit me and he was like, yo, Mike, I need you to pull up Ben Stadium, all black. I assume you know what this is about. <laughs> I'm thinking Kanye is gone already. So I'm like, I have no idea. But you're my brother, so I trust you. <laughs> so I pulled up, and I was I was hopeful. I'm like, yo, maybe Kanye's still here, kicking it for another day after after everything. And I walk to the security in the back. I check in. I'm like, yo, Mike Norris. They're like, okay, make a phone call. You're good. Buzz me in. And I, I get there, and I'm just looking. I'm like, yo, where am I? No one knows where I'm supposed to go. Like everybody's just like running around doing shit. Like no one's standing still. Like everybody's just in motion. And I I turn the corner. And I just walk by faith, not by sight. I'm like, I hope I'm going the right direction. I see a lot, a lot of people wearing black over here. And eventually, I hear his voice. I hear, I'm the youngest black billionaire in America. I'm the most successful black man in America. I'm the black Bill Gates. I'm like, okay. All right, is that? Poke my head. I'm like, yeah, that's yay. Yay's is going on, like giving a spiel about everything. And uh, I meet my, my team, which is a bunch of other young executives here in Atlanta uh, that, that shared that experience with me. Saren, Saren was one of them. And we, you know, we just got to work. Like, like Lauren was Ye's assistant at that time. And Lauren would be like, Ye needs this, Ye needs this. But then, like, John Monopoly, who was his manager, would pull on me like, yo, you, you, and you, come with me, do this. So we were just, like, all over the place with different people from his team grabbing us, the uh, relaying orders, like, we we would have to leave and go buy things. Had to go buy him body wash, or I had to go buy a weight for him so he, so he could work out. Um, so it was like just a lot of running. But in those moments while you're waiting on orders is like really where the magic was because you got to see how he interacted with people, and that's like like me being from Illinois. It's like yo, this is somebody who I idolized growing up. You know, somebody who you know was one of those things that attracted me to music like seeing seeing gay and i'm like okay cool he's from illinois i'm from illinois like i think i could do this too i think there's something special about you know the city and, and, and the culture like growing up in that that can affect your sound and i'm like yo i think we had similar environments so like he kind of was one of those other driving forces that that pushed me into music and his different approach to it so me being in that space with everybody like like with him and hearing how he talks to people because you always think like oh, yeah, he's an asshole, or he is uh, a narcissist, or all these different things that, that people portray him as online, but then you see him in person, and I'm like, oh, no, this is a godly man. This is a man of God. This is a man who truly understands, like, the impact of his words and actions, even though we might, you know, interpret them as being reckless. It's like he understands the impact, but he has a different way of seeing it or an outcome that we're not even thinking of that that he's trying trying to get out of the situation that might not be immediate it might be delayed but you know just seeing like you know he'll go off on somebody and i'm thinking okay they're about to cry and they're just motivated like they're like yo okay cool yeah believe in me like that's what they got from that like he could have said whatever but they just got like, okay he believes in me okay he's giving me a chance and you know how he built the project together from you know like rick rubin rick rubin that was one of the cool moments like rick rubin was walking out and he was like i don't know how you're a professional if you're not even a student, just walk, stop, stood in front of us, said that, walked out the room. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, all right. Like, you just got to be on, on just paying attention at all times because it's like, you're like, oh, is that? It is. Like, and yeah. they're just wisdom, like pearls of wisdom being dropped by all the different creatives that walk in and out the room. And, you know, that was really like, for me, like you talk about flipping opportunities, I'm like, okay, cool. While some people were focused on like trying to get a picture with Ye or impressing Ye, I'm like, Ye's here to work. Ye's on the job. Ye ain't paying me no attention. Like if I do a good job, I'm probably not gonna get a good job from him. But if I get uh, if I do a good job, I might be able to stay here longer. But I'm like, yo, if I leave today, I'm leaving here with something. So I focus on just building relationships with the producers that I saw around because I'm like, one of y'all is gonna get on this project. Most of y'all might get on this project. And if once you guys are locked in this project, I mean, you were locked in, now I'm locked in with Yay, and that's not just like a that's that's a for everything. Like 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 we we can, you know, if your relationship with him is good, and then I'm able to be around more and build more relationships with different people on this team, I'm like, yo, this is just like a lifelong thing. So I'm like, yo, I just need one lifeline. I just need to build like a genuine relationship with 
with one person from 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 this camp. Like I don't. And so let me just see how I can be an asset to just one person. Like like who who needs help? Who needs something that I can provide? Like okay, yeah, you're working with Yay, but what does your team need? What do you need as a person? Like mm-hmm. like how can I be be that person for you? Because once this album comes out, like y'all are gonna need a bag. Well, I got I got a great relationship with Ultra. I got re- so I got I got access to money. I can get you guys a quarter million dollar deal, half million dollar deal. So cool. That's that's one angle. But you know, there's Sony A and R's there as well. So I'm like, okay, cool. Let me not be too heavy on that. Maybe I can go the management route. I'm managing my clients. They're doing success. We got uh, things going on. But I was just trying my best. Like, okay, where what was my end? Like, how can I be of value to these these people? But ultimately, it just came from me being a person. Like. Yeah. Like, forget all the business stuff. Like, one dude was from uh, Carbondale. I'm from Marion. Carbondale's right next to Marion. My mom graduated from Carbondale. She went to SIU. And so I'm like, yeah, my mom. Yeah, I was like, my mom from, uh, I'm like, I'm from Illinois. He's like, we're part. I'm like, Marion. He's like, no, you're not. And then we just started going back and forth. I'm like, yeah, my mom went to SIU. He's like, you ain't going to no SIU. I'm like, yeah, no, she went to Carbondale. He's like, nah. And then, like, he started pulling up some of these people's contacts, and I recognized the area code. It was, like, Marion uh, area code and Carbondale area code. And that, that was when I met Fireman. Like, me and him just, like, hit it off. Like, just, like, on, on, on some human human stuff. And it was just, he was always genuine. I was genuine. So we just stayed in touch. I connected with DJ Speedy. Um, and he was just more so just pouring into me because he could see I was hungry for education and hungry to make something out of this. I, don't, I didn't care about clout. I'm not like a clout type of person because I know ultimately like the attention is going to come from the work that I do yep. like so mm-hmm. rather than take advantage of this moment and look cool I'm like let me just work this moment and maybe in five years or ten years I'll be able to execute or do something with this that's that's worth talking about dope oh man everything you said I mean I feel like it's just textbook for how to look at, uh, um, at opportunities look at people within the industry because we talk about like fans not looking at artists as humans or whatever and how labels might not look at artists and people as humans, but even the upcoming, you know, execs or just somebody who's trying to get in as an intern, we kind of do the same thing at times where you're yeah. so busy, you're so hungry trying to look for an end. You just forget that, you know, these are people that I can connect with. And like you said, all you need is one. Um, and because and then that cascades, right? Mm-hmm. And then those people, if you're cool, they'll connect you with their people. Like it just becomes an organic thing. So that's dope. Artists, I'm about to put you onto something that's gonna make your life so much easier. I got a platform for you. Because if you wanna be able to text your fans, we got you covered. If you want to be able to put a link in your bio that's simple and you don't have to switch back and forth, we've got you covered. As a matter of fact, if you want to be able to promote your music, we've got you covered all from this platform called Forever Fans. As a matter of fact, users who use this platform have already seen 10 times the amount of shares of their music. That's how you know they're real fans. And 2.5 times the amount of followers on Spotify, which we know that contributes to boosting your algorithm. The forever fan strategy is a strategy that goes beyond just creating some trending sound, going viral, because most people focus on getting views for the day, but what matters the most are fans for life. Check out foreverfanmusic.com. One question before we get too far away from it though, and I think I asked you this when we talked before, but it reminds me, I just saw a clip today where um, Julius Randle was talking about how Kobe had cursed folks out at a practice, but he was inspired by it, right? Mm-hmm. You just talked about Kanye talking, you know, how Kanye talks mm-hmm. and someone was, was, was motivated by it. If that wasn't Kanye, though, and he was talking the way, the way he was talking, how do you think he would have taken it? Man, he might throw hands. <laughs> <laughs> so it definitely makes a difference being in a position before you, you're you able to talk a certain way. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you ain't done it. If you ain't nobody, you talking yeah. me crazy. It's like, nah, bro, I got to see you about that. But <laughs> if you've hit a certain level, it's like, okay, well, this might be coming from a place of love because yeah. you want me to make it to where you at. So yeah. you're like, yo, bro, I'm this tough on you because what I'm giving you actually works. And yeah. I need you to take this seriously and respect that. Mm. Which goes back to what Rick Rubin said in terms of being a student mm-hmm. first, yep. right? Yep. Right. And that student space is, is like it's a lot of ego swallowing, right? Yeah. Right. But well, well, let's clarify, right? You said you met Fireman. That's how you hit hit it off with him. But you became his manager for, mm-hmm. from that situation, right? Yes, sir. 
Now, what was that situation in general? Man, that was that was one of those those moments or those relationships. That was like a journey. I won't even, and we're we're still on the journey, but it's a journey that that builds my confidence as a manager because, mind you, like I'm in this is the top of the world. This is Kanye West. Like this is Donda. He rented out the Ben Stadium. Like there are more millionaires than than I can count just walking in and out. More successful music executives and entrepreneurs than than I even knew existed. And they're all hungry. Like they're all looking for opportunities too. They're trying to get clients. They're trying to close deals. So, you know, for me to get picked by him out of that out of the the like if I told you some of the people that wanted to manage him, you'd be like, what? And he picked you. So I'm like, like, out of all these people that wanted to work with him, like he picked me, like it was, it was an honor. But for it was also a fight, like because for me, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna prove my worth because I, I don't, and this might be a, to my detriment, but like I don't like taking opportunities I don't feel like I deserve or I'm worthy of. Like if I feel like, like if I know somebody that can do the job better than me and they want the job and then I have it, like either every day I gotta like prove to myself like I deserve this more than them or or or. I can do a better job than they can, or I'm gonna just end up giving it to them. So for 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 Faya, I was like, okay, like I like you as a person, so I want you to be in the best position. But just because somebody has like more clout or more time in the industry than than I do doesn't necessarily mean they're better for the role mm-hmm. because I'm young and I give a fuck. So while somebody else might be lackluster with how they pursue things that could advance your career or might not necessarily have their eyes on opportunities for you. Like me, I'm actively like, okay, what's gonna help him be better? What's gonna help him be bigger? What's gonna like like how can I make more people aware of him? How can I get him more respect? How can I get him paid more money? Like like how can I help him take care of his people? Because he really takes care of his people. And so it goes back to that human aspect of I'm like, I like you as a person. So like beyond all this music stuff, I don't want to see you down. And it just made me go like that much harder for him. So it was like getting podcast interviews or getting him sessions with different artists or, you know, I got him paid for, for, for working on a project. I got him interviews with every outlet he wanted to get on. So, like, I used, because like, I have all the contacts to make pretty much anything shake for anybody. It just has to make sense for both parties. And with him, it made sense. It's like, yo, he worked with Ye. Of course he can come on here. Yo, he, did. yeah, like, he, and before he even worked with Ye, like, he was still an artist and his stuff was buzzing in Chicago. So, it's like, yo, he's worthy of respect with or without this. That the Ye stuff is just a plus. So, I, I, I took pride in, like, sh- championing him and, and putting him in position and just helping him grow his brand because, you know, as he grew, I grew as well. And, you know, that, that like, yeah, no, you my manager. It's like, okay, cool. Like, it, it's, like that, that was I don't know, it was everything to me because I know who who else he could have had. Mm-hmm. Really quickly, I would like to touch on another situation where you were an intern, right? And you flipped that. Can you tell that story real quick when you were interning at Mean Streets Thirty Studios? Yeah, Mean Streets. Um, that was yeah, that was definitely my sophomore year of college. I just changed my major to music management slash industry. And Mean Streets had DJ Drama. At the time, Chris Jones, he was the vice president of Atlantic Records. He had an office up there. And it was just popping, man. Like, every producer and their mom would be up there. Like, Playboy Cardi would be there regularly. Uzi, Jack Harlow. Um, yeah, like, that That whole Generation Now fan would just be up there, like, regularly. And, like, this is before Jack Harlow popped, so he'd just be walking around like a regular person. Uzi was famous, but... For some reason, like, he just treated us interns like regular people. Like, it was just cool. Like, he didn't, you know, he wasn't, like, an asshole to us. Like, he treated us like regular people. So it was just cool being around um, all those artists and really learning the culture and how to be comfortable in a studio and how to talk to people. Like, my first time being Playboy Cardi, I didn't know what he looked like. So I was in I was in the B room, and I was just cleaning up. And, like, he walked in the room, and he didn't say nothing. He just sat down. And I kept cleaning. I'm staring at him, and then he's staring at me, and I'm like, "Yo, you an engineer?" <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "Nah." I was like, "All right." He's like, "You an intern?" I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "That's cool. That's cool." Finished cleaning, walked out. I'm like, "Hey, uh, there's some tall guy in B room. Is he supposed to be there?" They're like, they ran, came back. It's like, "Oh, that's you don't know who Playboy Cardi is?" I'm like, "I do now." <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, I met um, a dude named AJ Room. I don't say I met him there. I met AJ in college, but at that time, he he had kind of pushed me to intern at Mean Streets because he was he was in, uh, he was engineer intern there. 
but he was going crazy. Like he was working with A Boogie, uh, Cardi B. Like did a he was working on a lot of big records with a lot of big people, and A Boogie just snatched him up, and made him his like full time engineer. So he did the the hoodie season album, like engineered that whole thing. And so I was interning. AJ knew I was interning for Rico, and he wanted to break as a producer. And you know that's my boy. We went to college together. So I'm like, hey. I can get Rico as your manager because Rico has this, 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 this. And as we were trying to coordinate a meeting between him and Rico, he's like, actually, I want you. I want, I want you to manage me because, you know, we had worked together at Mean Streets and, like, he's, you know, he saw how I interact with artists, how I interact with people, how people truly feel about me, what they say when I'm not in the room. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, I think you're you're qualified to represent me and I think you're intelligent enough to and respected enough to get me paid and, and not let me get taken advantage of, so... Yeah, that, that relationship with Mean Streets turned to me managing AJ and that 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 was like another one of those like when you ask like I realized I can make money in music, like working with AJ, like we got entire project budgets. Like mm-hmm. they, we would produce projects and get the entire production budget for it. So that's when I first saw like a, a six figure check. And this is like twenty twenty one, but like AJ is like my first producer management client and like we just got six figures for a project. So I'm like yo, and I'm I was like 25 at that time, so I'm like okay, if this is 25, like like we're getting six figures for projects, like the rest of, of my trajectory is is gonna be through the roof. Man, I just like to say the common thread is you've had situations where the people you end up working with seem to pick you because of who you showed yourself to be, which is pretty dope, which is pretty dope, man. Um, like. Unfortunately, obviously, we can't go as long as we wanted to today, you know, Uh, but I would love if you could, with the wisdom that you've imparted through your experience that you uh, shared today, uh, how do you provide like some final words, man, in terms of how you feel like people should think about the mute, their approach in terms of the music industry or navigate the music industry? What do you want to leave us with? Man, you know, a lot of people say it's a marathon, but they don't truly know what it is to run a marathon, like the level of preparation it takes to to perform in a marathon. Like you can't just wake up and go run a marathon tomorrow. Like that takes consistent effort. And that's how I view the industry. Like a lot of people, they're so focused on the now. It's like, well, I might not be up in three years. I might not be up in five years. I might not be in this situation. So let me milk the most out of it now. And in that, you lose a little bit of the integrity. Like you mm-hmm. lose a little bit of what makes you special because you're just going for anything. And you, you're you looking for the look. And we're people. Like, it doesn't matter what field you're in. Like everybody has a bullshit detector. So we can tell us, like, oh, you're not that close to this guy. Or you're not really involved in that situation like that. Or you know, you're 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 exaggerating your yourself and your role and, and it makes you cheap. It makes you cheap and it makes it you less attractive for people to work with. So I say like really take your time and prepare because it only takes one thing to go to your whole life to change. You get one good artist or one hit song or, you know, whatever the situation is, like like but it just takes one and your whole situation can change and it doesn't matter if you're 30, you're 40, you're 50. Like as long as you're you're chasing it, like like you could you could stumble upon it, you can create it for yourself. But the whole thing is you have to be valued. Like you don't want to be 30 years old and you got your 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 chance, but nobody wants to deal with you. So they try to separate you from the situation because the situation is good, the artist is good, the music is good, but they don't want to deal with you. So rather than elevate it in you, they're gonna separate you from the situation and try to break the artist without you because of what you did for yourself or your brand along the way. So I just say focus on, on like treat it, treat it like a long game, treat it like you're gonna be here until you're 50 and you're 60 years old and choose your, your shots wisely. Like don't swing at everything. Like, mm-hmm. like just be consistent, practice every day, study every day, be true to your word. I say yes to everything and then God meets me halfway. Like even if I feel unqualified, God doesn't qualify the call. Uh, God doesn't call the qualify, he qualifies the call. So that's been the story of my life. But I, I can say one thing I've seen work around the board is just being consistent, being consistent with what what you want and, and studying to, to, to be a master of that. Beautiful, beautiful, man. Appreciate you for stopping by, bruh. This is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary, people. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.